Okay, well, we got all that settled and out of the way, and now we are joined by a guest, or about to be joined by a guest. There was a shocking story that came out just yesterday as we record this on SportsIllustrated.com about Rocky Johnson, the father of, obviously, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. And the person who wrote that article was a, a historian who's been involved with a number of things, Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame books, Slam Wrestling, and we thought we would have him on to not only delve into this story, but uh, kind of discover how he discovered this and, and got on the trail to begin with. So that, that historian I'm speaking of is Greg Oliver. And Brian, I understand that you have made the necessary arrangements to tie him into our worldwide studio here. Is that correct? That is correct. And I believe we have him on the line right now. All right. Joining us on the program here today to talk about this week's well that escalated quickly moment in wrestling is a guy who is one of the premier historians in the game today we've enjoyed his series of books the pro wrestling hall of fame books with steve johnson of course he is the driving force behind the slam wrestling website he's done numerous articles and tons of research on a variety of historical wrestling topics and he's here now to i guess to be the maury povich on the program today <laughs> Greg Oliver. Greg, how are you? Thank you for being here. If I'm Maury Povich, which one of you is uh, Connie Chung, right? Wasn't that who he was married to at the time? They're still I, married. You know, they are still are happily they... married for the record. Well, thank God. Yeah, don't break them up, Greg. You've caused okay, enough well, sorry, and I'm not up on my, uh, my old news guys uh, kind of references. Okay, but I got that oh. one. Okay, Maury Povich. Your young, your young people have to look them up. Yeah, well, don't worry. Our audience is the average age of our audience is dead. Um, but no, this week, and I, we were just talking, Brian and I, before we went on the air, this week has been a little strange for wrestling, but I thought I'd heard all the stories, or I thought, you know, nothing surprises you anymore. And, and you know, we all see stories where a celebrity or a sports hero or someone in the public eye suddenly... Well, there's an unknown child that's, you know, been uncovered and we didn't know about this. But when I got on Twitter yesterday and I was scrolling through and I got to the sportsillustrated.com tweet and the head that it was a wait, what headline? Rocky Johnson, it has been discovered, has five heretofore unknown biological children in the family. And this, obviously, the article on Sports Illustrated, it was your byline. So, Greg, explain to us, if you can, how this happened and, more importantly, how you were able to, you know, uncover this still, I guess, developing series of events. They're still establishing relationships amongst all these siblings. It's uh, one of those stories that falls in your lap when you've been covering a beat for a long time. Uh, Ricky Johnson lives here in Toronto, and I've known him most of my wrestling life. I was a teenager, as you know very well, Jim. You get into the business, you have to have a few people trust you, and that's what happened. Ricky was one of the early guys that trusted me. I used to have in my phone book, I had the office written down, which was a bar where he would hang out. That was where I had the phone number where I knew to get him. And um, he was just a good guy. And so we've been in touch through the years. And uh, at his 65th birthday party, uh, I was out there and I met these people that said they were, three of them were there and they said they were sons of Rocky Johnson. And I sort of thought I knew Curtis, who is the one son of, of Rocky, uh, other than The Rock, of course, and then his sister Wanda, who lives in Toronto, who I'd talked to, but I've never met. And I thought okay, who are these people? And that was sort of the little genesis of things going. And then from there, Ricky explained things to me. And uh, soon enough, <laughs> I started you know, going down a path of, of putting these pieces together. They'd already all gotten into touch. And then during the process, another one comes along that uh, right after Rocky died, uh, Aaron found out that uh, Rocky was, was his father. So it was a, a crazy process to say the least, but enjoyable uh and the best thing that comes out of it is they have really found a new family together there's really no other way to put it they've become siblings uh, and they may live on opposite ends of the country they're from british columbia out on the west end of canada all the way get to 
Nova Scotia on the east end. So they've um, they've become very close, and it's quite lovely to see from my side. Well, and uh, and obviously Ricky Johnson, for folks who didn't read the article, is Rocky Johnson's half brother, uh, the Rock's uncle, and Ricky had a, a brief career in wrestling, uh, uh, tag teaming with Rocky and doing some, you know, independence up in the uh, Ontario and the, the Canada area. But uh, now, it is all of the newfound siblings, all of them are from Canada, or was there anyone from the States uh, added to the mix, I guess? Well, they, they were all sired in Canada, let's put it that way. The one guy did live in Florida for quite a while with his with his mom, who's passed. Uh, so yeah, so it's, it's very much a Canadian story, and, and here we are talking on Canada Day, even though I know it's not running on Canada Day. Uh, it's, it's, oh, it's Canada Day, that, that's like being the nicest guy in prison, Greg. Come on, Canada oh. Day. No, I, I kid, <laughs> I joke, I jest. Uh, um, but yeah, it's a Canadian story, and, and you're right, it, it's... Um, Rocky, well, it's a territorial business, right? And the one guy actually figured out from all the different Rocky Johnson results exactly what night he was probably conceived because he was coming to St. Catharines, Ontario, which is near Niagara Falls, Ontario, and figured out that was probably the night I was conceived. So, again, technology's changed some of these things. We've got these DNA tests. You have all these results. You can figure out things maybe you didn't need to know. Well, yeah, that's the uh, that's the manner and the method that they kind of all found each other, right? Because now with the new uh, DNA test, as you said, Ancestry.com or whatever, people are are being alerted to the fact of who they might be related to. And I guess in some cases that's a blessing, in some cases it's a curse. Um but the uh, the, I'm just the say, say Jim that it's not a wrestling specific story, and that's the best thing. But not this this. But what we've gotten out of the response so far is so many people saying we have similar stories, right? My dad never told right. us about this other child, and it, it's it's very common. And because of the technology change, uh, and and twenty three me and all these things, we are getting a lot more of these stories out there. It's just not very often you wake up and you realize you're, you know, related to one of the most famous people on the planet. Yeah, and and I think they made a great point. Uh, pretty much universally, all of them said that you know they don't have anything against The Rock, Dwayne, and and it, this is no reflection on him or you know fault of his, and they don't want anything from him. They just, you know, for one, I think was it the young lady had a specific, you know, just a hard time dealing with her father didn't want her. She tried to make contact and and. You know, it, it he wouldn't go along with it. So this is kind of helping them at this point find the rest of their family. And I, I don't know how to ask this question. Have they quit looking? Because is when something like this happens, we oh we found five of them. I mean, and, and Brian, you're more sports oriented minded than I am. You're here in this country. Of uh, Herschel Walker, they found two or three of his here lately, didn't they? I think they found one, and then they found two more. So three well, altogether know, they, in the last month. The light was better where they were looking in the second place. <laughs> um, but I mean, at that point, is is it kind of like a DUI? You know, however many times you get caught, how many more times did you do it? Have they, have the siblings all said, well, we guess this is the group, or are they continuing to investigate? So Lisa's the filmmaker and, and sort of the anchor of the story in many ways, the, the conduit by which a lot of it was told. And she is a very spiritual kind of person and, and you know, in touch with nature and all those kind of things. And, and she's adamant that there's at least two more out there. She thinks they're probably down in Georgia. There's some familiar ties to um, that area from uh, the other brothers. There were five brothers. Uh, that all came from that family that Rocky was from. Um, three were with one father and two were from another father, is, if I'm remembering correctly. And so, yeah, they, they did have some ties to Atlanta where the last brother who was alive besides Ricky uh, just passed away recently. His name was, well, they called him Bob. Um, so, yeah, they think there's one more or maybe two more down in Atlanta. And who knows? There's another story that I'd completely sort of forgotten about, and somebody asked me about it. Well, what about this woman down in California? 
So there was a woman in California who had basically presented herself to Rocky at an event and said, I'm your daughter. And he said, oh, well, let's do a DNA test. And then she never did. So that still could be the case. Maybe this emboldens her to, to actually go do the DNA test. I don't know. But I, I suspect there's probably more out there. I don't think uh, Rocky was a guy of, of many limits. Hey, Greg, if I could ask, where did that story come from, that Rocky was the one who volunteered to take the DNA test and she vanished? Well, that's what I heard from Rocky, if I remember. Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but I mean, again, as your son becomes one of the most famous people in the world, I'm sure he had that happen more than once. Yeah. Just and the, just and, the and also, um, I guess what I'm saying is the, the recognized children uh, that – Rocky had you talked about the two older ones were from his first marriage and they were on record and then the rock Dwayne came along what 20 no not 20 but uh, t at least 10 years later some of these children or did all of these children happen in the interim or did some come after Dwayne uh, Dwayne is the youngest of all of them Absolutely, 100%. And uh, So this was a 60s type of situation where all of the children were mostly born in the, in the 60s. And, you know, because I'm just thinking, you know, the thing is, The Rock on Young Rock or The Rock in any interviews, he never tells stories about the Carolinas. And, and uh, Rocky Johnson as Sweet Ebony Diamond was a big star right before he went to the WWF in... 83, 84, he was a big star in the Carolinas under the mask, and uh, The Rock has no stories for And that was probably, with the exception of the WWF run, Rocky Johnson's last big money run. He was a big baby face. You pray, you saw him in Toronto, did you not, at that point? Well, he was definitely up Are you old Toronto. enough? But well, I, I, this is the embarrassing part. I, I didn't get into wrestling until Hulkamania ran wild all over me. Ah, oh, son of a gun. <laughs> I know. Well, at it, least, at least he didn't come all over you like with God's <laughs> wrath like Miro does. <laughs> or Rocky, apparently, but okay. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, boy. Well, anyway, but I'm saying, you know, Rocky Johnson was a big baby face, spent a lot of time in the Carolinas. Um, the Carolinas had lovely women. Uh, he it, A lot of time in Tennessee. Um, it both in the seventies and right at the end of his career. And I'm just wondering if, if we need to, to follow Rocky's booking sheets on a, uh, on an Atlas to try to narrow down potential places to search. An Atlas with a birth, a birth records. Yeah, it is quite possible. And, but again, he's not alone in this and, and you, we saw it with a lot of these people responding to this story. It's like, you know, oh, my dad was in rodeo and he has a couple of kids in here and there. It, 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 it was part of the lifestyle. And, and I'm sure you saw some of that yourself, Jim. I mean, it doesn't make it right or wrong necessarily. That depends on your perspective. But there were a lot of people out there just sowing their wild oats because they could, because there was no wrestling, especially like there's no laws. I, I often have talked about, like in hockey, when I covered hockey or, or I just did a book with John Gibbons from, from baseball, these guys at least had a manager or a general manager or a trainer or somebody that's looking out for them a little bit, right? Wrestling had none of that. Nobody to report to until you got to the actual arena. So you had all that free time to kill. Nobody was getting you on that bus or wherever you needed to go for the next time. Your time was all your own. So it was a, it's the Wild West. Well, and yeah, and as we've talked about, also you're on television. You're making a, a, in some territories a lot of money, depending on the guy and the spot. Um, you know, it it was it was like the rock and roll uh, lifestyle tour. But and I've known guys that, you know, I've known well enough on a personal basis that they say, yeah, you know, I had a kid with so-and-so and such and such and they pay child support or maybe they don't have a relationship or maybe they do but and brian i mean this is not something that would have been written down in any other historical pieces but have you ever heard this is just like the all-time champion especially to find out all at one time have you ever heard about anybody in the wrestling business being 
outed or it called attention to that they suddenly had, you know, five extra kids that nobody knew about. Well, there this have, is it's yeah. There have been children that pop up and point the fingers at different people, but no one as prolific yeah. apparently as Rocky Johnson. Yes, they, I mean we're we're going for we're going for Guinness status here, and I, I some people maybe say, well, you know, Greg, you you knew uh, Ricky, but uh, what do you know about Rocky Johnson? Rocky had spoken to you at first about that his ill-fated autobiography that went through a number of hands. Uh, at one time, you had spoken to him about being his co-writer on that. Absolutely. So I've known Rocky since, I think we met in 2003, if I'm remembering right. Uh, you know, Ricky always was a friend of mine. And, and when his brother was coming up to Toronto with his um, third wife, Sheila, uh, my wife and I, and we, we went for dinner with them. Um, so that was my first chance to meet Rocky Johnson. And what I remember about it is I brought a copy of the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, The Canadians. And he'd gotten it the night before. I think must have given it to Ricky to give to Rocky. And when I saw them at dinner, Sheila said to me, he read that damn book all night. Like, it was just fascinating because at the time, there wasn't a lot of books like that one, right? They'd go back and capture all these guys that you'd forgotten about, right? The guys that he knew growing up in Hamilton and, and learning the business, so the Ernie Moores, the guys that, you know, never became big stars anywhere else, but they were in this book. So he loved it. Right. His original publicity photo was in there. So we kept in touch through the years. You know, he might be in Toronto for something. He came up with a WWF food bank thing. Um, he came up when his brother Mervyn was dying uh, to say goodbye, and we had breakfast, you know, that kind of thing. So we'd always kept in touch. And when he wanted to do a book, he got in touch. I mean, I'm a writer. He knows that. Um, so we talked about it, and I thought we had a deal. In fact, ECW Press had put together the deal, the contract, uh, which I had signed and had sent it had been sent to Rocky to sign. Uh, it was exciting for ECW press because he was also a Canadian. So they could get double the tax credit, um, <laughs> but, but it, it, it's a small part of publishing, right? But that, that extra right. few thousand dollars go a long way to making profitability for a book. And so, yeah, we had a, we had a contract that was signed on my part that I never got response to and I never heard why. Uh, he never, so he ghosted me, I guess is, is what the kids say. And, and, you know, whatever, I moved on. In fact, I, I think I turned out better because I didn't end up doing that book. And of course, it ended up being a huge mess anyway, which has been covered to a degree before. But, um, you know, the Rocks people stepped in and had the book pulled. Um, a mid-level publisher like ECW Press isn't going to be able to fight the Rocks people. Let's be realistic. Well, and I guess now I'm realizing, and Brian, I know your age. I'm the only person in this conversation that actually saw Rocky Johnson wrestle in his in his prime, or in maybe in person. Did you ever see him in person at all, Brian? No, I never saw Rocky Johnson. When I first became a big fan, Rocky Johnson wasn't around. Like there were a few years where. I mean, maybe if you were following the indies, you may see seen his name, but he wasn't really a figure around wrestling when I became a fan. Well, we talked about this before. He had two really big runs at the end there. The Crockett run as Sweet Ebony Diamond, and then the WWF run with Tony Atlas, and they were tag team champions. And then for what, from 1985 through 87, it was pretty much... Polynesian Pro and Memphis and the territory was down there and he didn't last long and had some issues and and then no one saw him on TV again until The Rock until Rocky Maivia yeah. showed up and brought his dad with him on TV a few times and that was as we mentioned uh, or as we were talking about uh, Brian and I before we went on the air again Greg Rocky Johnson didn't linger on he was he was a main event guy for most of his career, and then suddenly those last couple of years, and he's in his mid-40s, and the territories go away, and boom, and you don't see Rocky Johnson anymore. But in his prime, and I didn't even get to see him till 76, um, so he'd been in the business, what, 12, 13, 14 years, somewhere around there from his start of his training at that point. He was amazing. Because not only the athleticism, but the physique, he had the big chest and the big arms, he was 
it wasn't a competition bodybuilder, but he had a great physique. He worked out, and especially in some of the territories back then, you know, that was unique. And, but at the same time, he could do the drop kicks, and he could, you know, it sounds like now Cornette's going to be complimenting flippy wrestlers. He could take the backdrop and land on his feet and throw the drop kick, but he did it at six feet tall and 250 pounds with a bodybuilder physique. And he'd put both of those feet right on the guy's forehead. Uh, doing the Ali shuffle, the fucking quick jabs. It was, he, he was exciting and he got over and drew money. And I think you mentioned in your article, Greg, that he had actually even more of an underrated type of career. He was on top more and in better spots for longer than people realize today. I think it's because that, like we said, he had the last two runs of his career and then faded off right as home video became a thing so he's the generation before we have video to see how good he was that's an excellent point and I, that was actually Meltzer that said you know because he's not in the the uh, observer hall of fame and he probably should be based on you know the number of places that he was on top and that's the nature of the business though right at the time right he was territorial he would go from place to place and be on top for a good amount of time, but never really stayed in one spot for a long time. And when we talk about his WWF run there right at the end, I mean, he was not there a long time. And it's almost criminal to say that was, you know, when everybody talks about that being the most meaningful part of his career, because it wasn't. He would have been making oodles of money out there in San Francisco, working with Pat Patterson and Ray Stevens and all those guys. It, it's yeah, it, it, but that's revisionist history, isn't it? It's WWF saying, "Hey, look, he was our. They were the first black champions together. They weren't the first black, you know, tag team champion, but they were the first black tag team champions together." Well, and and Which, also and Sonny King, I guess, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> and hey, uh, Strongbow was Italian, as that doesn't really count. But um, you were going to say Rocky. Native Americans for another minority, and then you remembered he was Italian. Yeah, well, yeah, I was going to say they could have been the 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 black and red express or whatever. Um, but Strongbow's Italian, so That's right. That's... nevertheless, and yeah, that is one thing you bring up that Rocky Johnson. It was not. I think a lot of the uh, romantic stories of nostalgic days of Rocky, the Rock's youth on Young Rock, center on. Rocky Johnson not making any money in, in that last run in Memphis in 1987 when everything sucked. Or maybe not making any money in Polynesian Pro because by that time there wasn't really money out there or whatever. The but flea market it, one. Yeah, like the, the flea market, yeah. Too, yeah. Uh, but in, and like you said, in California and San Francisco and Los Angeles, Rocky Soul Man Johnson in the 60s was a huge deal and he was on top for Roy Shire and he would have made big time cow palace payoffs and of the the uh, um the way that he came into Tennessee we've told his story but it's been a few years we've got a lot of new listeners you probably know but Brian you remember but the the same month and year that Muhammad Ali fought Antonio Inoki in Japan the only boxer versus wrestler match that actually made money was Jerry Lawler versus Rocky Johnson. Because Ali and Inoki, as everybody recalls, ended up being not only a critical failure, but a financial flop because nobody gave a shit, except for in the Northeast where Bruno came back to, you know, get revenge on Hanson. But with all the publicity in the papers, Jerry Jarrett said, Psh, I got an idea. And he brought a boxer into Memphis to face Jerry Lawler, boxer versus wrestler, Rocky Johnson. And he got this on the news, the actual local television news in Memphis, Tennessee. Boxer Rocky Johnson from Houston, Texas, with a such and such record. He's been a sparring partner for George Foreman. And he's going to face Jerry. And they drew over 10,000 people at the Mid-South Coliseum based on the Ali and Noki publicity for a fight that nobody in Memphis wanted to see. But they bring in a guy that's been a wrestler for 15 years, call him a boxer. He'd never wrestled there. Nobody knew the difference. And put him against Lawler, and they fucking did 10,000 people. So then all of a sudden after that, 
Jared said, fuck, we're going to teach him how to wrestle. Within a month, wouldn't you know who won the pony? He had trained to be a successful professional wrestler. With only four weeks experience, he's back wrestling Lawler. <laughs> and they drew nothing but money. And But you could get away with that back then. But it was from that point on, Rocky Johnson was a name in Tennessee. He came back again a couple years later, came back again a couple years later when Lawler was out with the broken leg and they were trying everything. But he always stayed over as a drawing card in, in the Tennessee Territory. And one of the few outside guys really to do that. It Generally, as a, a top babyface, you had to be a homesteader. But he, he did it. That's, That's not even a question, is it? <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's what? fascinating. I mean, he just loves telling the stories. But I, but I think Rocky had that ability, right? Like, he knew he could draw money. And and he did have some legit boxing skills, right? He he, he wasn't right. immune to it and had met those guys along the way, um, you know, the different boxers. And, and so it worked. And, and that's a credit to the, the Memphis guys and, and Rocky being able to adjust at that point in his career, right? It is a little later. Um, he'd already well, and, his, and also he was actually business. he was actually a better worker than any greater boxer that ever got into wrestling afterwards. So, you know, it's it's mutually exclusive skills, but he could work boxing better than the real boxers. He also never pandered, and and that's one thing they did get right in the the young rock stuff is he never did the typical African American shtick, right? They never did yeah. the watermelon stuff with him or this and that. So he stood for what he believed. Now, this has been talked about before, but I mean, racism in in Eastern Canada, Nova Scotia, where he's growing up, it's not that it didn't exist. It's just it's going to be a different racism than if you grew up in Mississippi or or Tennessee or something. So. He came at it with a different perspective as he moved across um, the country and, and, well, the world, really. But, I mean, because he traveled across Canada first, I think he really got emboldened, right? He understood what he was doing, moving from Hamilton to Toronto to Calgary to Vancouver and, and his trips back east to work um, out in uh, Atlantic Canada. So he, he was already a developed wrestler before he went down to the States and started working in L.A. and San Francisco. So he had confidence about him that he was able to say to a promoter, no, I'm not going to be your step and fetch it or that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the thing is that um, Rocky, they 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 made his gimmick hometown, Houston, Texas, because. I don't know, maybe he didn't look like a guy that needed to be from Amherst, Nova Scotia or whatever. That's sort of like a guy named Reggie changing his name to Crusher. It doesn't sound, you know, but but besides the the nod to the nickname the Soul Man and Soul Patrol later on in with Atlas, you're right, he didn't do any black shtick. And because and like you said, because he was Canadian, he had you know, it it wasn't part of his vocabulary anyway it wasn't like suddenly he's going to turn into tom boogaloo shaft who's from mississippi or whatever so the it, it was he was a black baby face that got over like in memphis where there was a heavy african-american population but he wasn't he wasn't doing goofy shit he wasn't doing stereotypical shit it's just he was a top guy now on and Brian doesn't watch Young Rock, so I got to fill you in on this, Brian. The scene they were gonna go work in Jonesboro, and somehow Jonesboro had a different promoter uh, than the Memphis territory did. He'd been booked out to Jonesboro, so you know the behind the scenes thing is all whacked anyway. But Rocky shows up, Brian, in the 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 Jonesboro Coliseum, like there exists such a thing. And he walks into his first class locker room and sits down and the promoter brings in a tray of fried chicken and watermelon for Rocky as a prop to do his promo about his opponent that night. Yeah, you'll just be sitting there eating your fried chicken and watermelon. And Rocky said, nah, I ain't going to do that. And he takes, he doesn't take the guy's money. He walks out, right? Even though he needs it. Now that is, what do they call that? Greg, you're a, you're a published author. They, they call that kind of a um, of an aphorism. Is that am I using that correctly for something that may have happened? Is like a, an example of of 
how Rocky wouldn't go along with racism. But there was two things wrong with the the scene. One, well, you, the, 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 well, the, the part you need to add, though, though, is that The Rock was standing there as a kid. So he's yeah. seeing that lesson from his father. Yes. So that's, that's the definite takeaway that's out of there. But you're right. I agree. OK, keep going. Sorry. I want well, to the, that. The, the two things that made this particular incident completely and utterly impossible is, number one, they showed him into a first class locker room in the Jonesboro Coliseum. <laughs> And secondly, when they brought the fried chicken and watermelon out, it looked like it had just come from the kitchen at Morton's Steakhouse. If you had actually brought that tray of chicken and watermelon out to anybody, white, black, Mexican, Russian, anybody working Jonesboro in the fucking 80s, they would have been all over that shit like uh, fucking that's, that's their last meal. That was the most appetizing looking thing I've ever. We had no catering back then. They had no, you couldn't get a free fucking bottle of water. Did they do a lot of promos at the arena shows in Jonesboro in the ring? No, no, that's what I mean. It was, it was, it was a, it was a completely made up scene out of whole cloth to illustrate that The Rock learned from his father Rocky not to do any stereotypical offensive stuff but it would no, though i would just die and laughing at the goddamn the promoter in jones but eddie marlin would have gone to town on that goddamn tray of chicken and watermelon <laughs> it was a great because <laughs> if you'd ever been to the con to the uh concession stand in the jonesboro legion arena or later the earl bell community center which apparently was what was passing for the jonesboro coliseum oh you know that raccoon they shot down out of that tree in that Jerry Clower story? They were selling it on a stick <laughs> at the concession stand in Jonesboro. Hey, Greg, if I could ask you a question uh, that I was thinking about from the article, and it's something I did not ask you on the mothership, but you make reference in the article. You know, no one knows about these kids. Reading this article is the first time Jim heard about this, me, and just about everyone else, almost everyone else. And in the article, you reference the fact that when... Rocky left where he was, where he fathered these children. Other wrestlers actually looked out for them, which opens the idea that other wrestlers were aware of these other children. Do you know what wrestlers were actually aware of or looked after Rocky Johnson's children when he left the territory? So there was only the one instance where this really came up. So where Lisa Purves is, is the one that was the um, filmmaker, and she's sort of the, the center of the article just because she's like the strong one, but it, telling a documentary of her own story and, and and her own progress trying to get through this. And as Jim alluded to, she, she's had all kinds of issues, you know, depression, trying to deal with, you know, the, the lack of a father figure. So she, her mom lived in a place right across the street from basically where all the wrestlers lived, right? Like in Vancouver, they had like a little, I guess you'd call it almost like a townhouse or a, a flop house, right? Where the wrestlers would be coming in and staying for their short amount of time and then leaving instead of having the rent spot because Vancouver was very much a territory where the guys would come in and maybe then go to Vancouver or sorry, and then go to Japan or then go down to Hawaii or wherever, because it was a, a good transient spot. You could have guys there for a week and then they'd move on somewhere else. And then you'd still have your homesteaders. So she met Rocky at one of those spots. And they started dating. So she already knew the other wrestlers that, that would be staying at this you know, house next door. So they knew like Moose Murawski, who was a local guy, or Abdullah the Butcher was a young guy coming up around the same time, who was one of them that definitely knew about this baby. And Lisa said that Abdullah the Butcher would look out for them and bring them little bits of cash or maybe diapers or things like that. These are stories she heard. Um, years later, when Lisa tried to get in touch with Rocky, Moose Murawski, who's gone now too, actually went to Rocky in Hawaii and said, your daughter is trying to get in touch with you. Can you please, you know, do it? And so he did that. But Rocky said no to him and said he didn't want to talk to Lisa. So I'm just trying to remember how Lisa explained all this. But the fact of the matter is that he went home and said, oh, I didn't do it to Lisa instead of so he was protecting her. He didn't instead say, of having to tell her him, that, yeah, that, that Rocky wanted up. nothing to do with him. Yeah. So, I mean, there's that aspect out there for sure. Where uh, certainly lots of wrestlers knew 
Uh, Ricky knew that his brother had a few other kids. Uh, they didn't know about them all, um, nor could you <laughs> a lot. Uh, but yeah, it's quite fascinating. Uh, and and Lisa, having gone through all that, that was a, that was the one example that comes up when you think of that when you ask me that question there, Brian. Has there been any pushback at all from the Rock's camp about this article? I mean, this is a pretty mainstream appearance. Sports Illustrated, still a big deal. Any pushback at all? Um, not pushback. The the Rock's people were asked to, were informed about all this at least a month ago. Um, and I know they had talks with people higher up at Sports Illustrated than I than I am and certainly my editor. And so he was feeding stuff back to me. So they knew about this, but they also knew about most of these kids at least since Rocky's death. So this, none of these people were really news to the people in the family or, you know, in general, it's just, it was news to the public. All these people have been very public on their Facebook posts, calling each other brothers and sisters. You could have done the math um, if you wanted before now, it's just putting this story out there so publicly uh, has been an issue. The one son, Curtis, who was um, from the first marriage to Una Sparks and lives in Toronto, he's been a little upset by it all. But there's no leg to stand on, right? There's nothing actionable. You can't defame a dead person, number one. But, I mean, what's there in there that's bad to Curtis or to Wanda? It's just presenting the facts of these other children. And again, they're not asking for anything. They're not saying, hey, Rock, you're our brother now. Fly us down to Miami. Buy us a house. You can film it. Not oh, come on that. now. He likes there, doing There are that. a lot of people Never expecting said. that now, yes. That, you, can't ex- you, can't expect the, you can't expect The Rock to spend all his money on film crews. But <laughs> here's the thing. Speaking of film, the obviously the uh, uh, Lisa, who's the young lady that's that's a filmmaker and is doing a documentary and this was brought on again not because it was wrestling but because it was her trying to come to grips with her, the complicated relationship or lack of that she had with her father and it became then it's becoming a documentary are you going to keep us up to date and post it on the documentary as it goes forward, if it goes forward, if it's completed, where it goes, uh, anything on slam wrestling to keep us up to date. So we know how this all comes out. Yeah, I, I would, I definitely hope to, uh, Lisa's become a pretty good friend through this process. Like she really is the spokesperson for the family, um, with all those other, cause I mean, you're, you're dealing with four different personalities uh, besides her. Right. And, and they're all from different walks of life. She at least works in media and works in film. So understands what I need. Uh, so she's been great. Whereas, you know, if you, if you grew up and, and you do construction, you don't maybe know my needs the same way as, as a journalist. Right. Uh, for sure. She's going to keep me in the loop. Uh, she's actually going to lower herself. She wants to put me on film. Uh, I haven't told her my rate yet though. So that may be an issue. <laughs> Uh, you, but yeah, she I, should, I, I she should she just re- record you on audio, Greg. You sound so much better on audio. There you go. Yeah. Well, then you look on video. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, no, I know. And that, but I, I go along the way. Well, that brings up the Sweet Daddy Siki documentary that I worked on. Um, and Siki was one of Rocky's mentors. And for that matter, I mean, the boots that the Rock wore were directly from Sweet Daddy Siki, right? They were inspired by him. Uh, with the cutouts at the back and but the the Siki is, is interesting too because you you learn about these different people and and he must have known some of these things about rocky through the years and i'm sure they all have their own secrets and many of them are going to take them with them when they're when they're gone and we we should just uh, instead of glossing over that everybody in the world knows who sweet daddy Siki is he was a pioneering trailblazing African-American talent in the wrestling business who started even before Rocky and was Siki was working in the fifties, right? Oh yeah. And, absolutely. Yeah. No, he started in LA with uh, Sanders Abo and those guys. Yeah. And, uh, then later on became a, uh, uh, country music star and a musician released albums, all that stuff and wrestled for uh, not continuously, but didn't he wrestle like 40 or 45 years after his debut, a few matches, he wrestled at an advanced age. I remember that. Yeah, well, he he was supposed to be on that tour with the Bear Man, uh, where Adrian Adonis and, and um, Pat Kelly died, along with Bear Man McKigney. So he was supposed to be on that tour. So after that crash, he never wrestled again. So that was 88. 
So he wrestled. Yeah, that's 40 years. That's a pretty good run. <laughs> Uh, and and pioneered the bleach blonde hair look that they gave to Shelton Benjamin later on. And when people would tell <laughs> Shelton he looked like Sweet Daddy Seeky, you'd go, what the fuck? Because even I didn't go deep enough in the catalog to teach him about Sweet Daddy Seeky. But um, <laughs> speaking of teaching us, when are you doing another Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame book with Steve? Or what's next in the way of projects? I love all of the writing you do and all the research you do on these stories and people that would otherwise be forgotten. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate that. You know, it, it's, there's always more to write about. It's just what's worth my time. It sometimes comes up, right. Or our projects may be interesting, but I've got to justify, you know, living. <laughs> right. <laughs> Because, yeah, the wrestling business ain't really good for that. Uh, so I have a book with John Gibbons, the former Blue Jays manager. I played for the Mets, and I know um, Brian's pretty excited. He's a big Mets fan. Oh, uh, that's boy. coming out in the spring. By the way, what Greg meant to say is he played for the Mets. He also managed the Blue Jays in that order. Okay, yes, exactly. It's a different way around. Yeah, I didn't come back. Well, he could help the Mets today, maybe. I don't know. Um, Greg, you didn't genuflect toward the Mets direction uh, <laughs> uh, properly enough for Brian there, but continue with the things you're going to be doing. Um, the the one that's going to shake the world is uh, Medusa's book. I worked with Medusa Michelli on her book, uh, who was a Lundra Blaze in WWE. She has a remarkable story um, on its own, but the fact that she then went from you know pro wrestling into monster trucks is insane. Yeah. There's never been a book for adults on monster trucks. So we're breaking all kinds of new ground there. So it's, uh, I'm hoping it ends up being a little bit like the Mick Foley idea where, you know, it gets mainstream attention to something that's never been out there because I've now met and talked to a lot of these monster truck people. And there's certainly possibilities for more books out there. Um, other than that, I'm not exactly sure what's up wrestling wise. So I'm always open for the next idea. If it's going to make me a few bucks, uh, you know, the Resi book did pretty well. And, uh, you know, you want to keep plugging away. Uh, the slam stuff continues to write itself, right? One week may have a great story on Ranger Ross, who nobody ever <laughs> writes about. And then next week we have something on, on some indie person you've never heard of that just has an interesting story. I like the ability to do different things and not chase the same old, same old rumors and just be a tweet machine like so many of these sites are these days, right? It's actually talking to people. Like that's probably the, some of these great sites are out there doing good work and others are just, yeah, they're compilers, right? They just retweet things or they just collect things that other people have done and never broke a new ground. And, and we continue to break new ground on a regular basis at Slam. And that's, and, it, and like we always say, if news breaks, we take it back and get a refund. <laughs> And if you, when you mentioned Ranger Ross, I just got to tell you this real quick because it just it reminded me of Bobby Eaton. Anything that reminds me of Bobby Eaton is fucking hilarious. But Ranger Ross, as you know, he had the he was in the service and he was in the invasion of, or at least this was the story. And I mean, you know, I never know anymore, right? I believe these things because they were telling the boys. But he was in the invasion of Granada, and he was a paratrooper. And right. then, of course, that Ranger Ross, right? And he was very military and tried to portray that and wasn't a bad worker, but just one of those things in WCW, it didn't make it. But when he first got there, right, and they were first telling a story, he walked in the locker room one night and Bobby Eaton looked at me and said, hey, Corn, did you hear that they dropped him out of a helicopter in Grenada? <laughs> <laughs> I I think he went of his own accord, Bobby. I don't think they dropped, but it just the way he phrased it. It was hilarious <laughs> to me. It was the Bobby Eaton delivery corn. Did you know they dropped him out of a helicopter in Grenada? Yeah, you should see the way they threw him out of the back of that truck in Pittsburgh. <laughs> All right. Do you remember his anyway. finishing? What's his finishing maneuver, Jim? Ranger Ross. Ranger Ross. Oh, my God. What was it? I can't remember. The combat kick. That's right. And it was made out of potatoes. <laughs> oh, anyway, Greg, thank you for being a, a, a guest here on the program today and bringing us up to date on this. We think we've heard all of the wild, shocking stories that we're going to hear. And then suddenly somebody like you, you no good muckraker, comes up with one of those 
wait, what headlines that we've got to delve a little bit deeper into. And they can do that at slamwrestling.com, right? They can buy all, are all of the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame books by Greg Oliver and Steve Johnson. Are they still available on the, uh, the Amazon and everything? Yeah, it's, it's sorry, it's slamwrestling.net. Because Slam, somebody sorry. Slam, that somebody sitting on it doesn't want to sell it, and it was a little out of our price range. Well, um, those bastards. Yeah, no, of course. Exactly. The, the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, the Canadians is out of print, um, but all the rest of them are out there. I, I really encourage, like people haven't seen the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, the storytellers or heroes and icons were the ones that, that came a little bit later. Uh, those ones are amazing books. They're huge too. They're, they're just packed full of content. And and I know you may not be a fan of storytellers because it's got, you know, Jericho and, and Omega <laughs> on the cover, but we were trying to illustrate a point of how wrestling had changed, right? You can start a Twitter war and then, and lead to a program, you know, things have changed. And, and that was part of what the book was all about is, is well, storytelling whether, whether, change. whether they're storytellers or cautionary tales, whichever you still do great <laughs> books, but yeah, you've done the baby faces, the heels, the tag teams, the heroes and icons, the, the, uh, as you said, the Canadians, which is out of print fittingly enough, um, Boy, Canada can't get any respect on this program. But uh, anybody that wants anything, uh, wants to learn anything about wrestling history, can learn bunches of stuff by reading any of those books. Brian, Greg, I've never—I don't think I've ever actually asked you this, but if you don't mind, before you go, you brought up the uh, Hall of Fame Canadians book. What is the story about what happened with you and Bret Hart? Was it about that book? Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Well, yeah, this is going to go another couple of minutes then, but that's fine. Um. Long story short, Brett was not happy about the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, the Canadians. And he was ranked number 14 of all time. Um, there's no question in anyone's mind, as far as I will, in my mind, that Whipper Watson was the greatest Canadian wrestler of all time. He was our gorgeous George. And if this does not explain the differences between the U.S. and Canada, I don't know what else was. <laughs> <laughs> You know, he was the guy that sold all the TVs, right? A hero that, you know, let's have with a safety club and all these kind of things. And then you've got yeah. Gorgeous George selling all the TVs, you know, in the late 1940s, early 1950s, right? He's a villain. Um, so with Billy Watson changed the game. And without him, there is no Canadian wrestling. So he's number one. And, you know, I remember talking to Gene Kaniski once and I said, Gene, you're number six in my book. And, and he was all upset and he goes, well, wait, who's in front of me? And I said, Whipper Billy Watson, Yvonne Robert, Killer Kowalski, Mad Dog of Hachon, and Earl McCready. And then it was just sort of silence on the phone. And he goes, I'm okay with that. Yeah. So so it's a, it's a Brett Eagle thing. Uh, I've got no problem with Brett. Never have. I was at his house once. Um, got a Christmas card from him one year. So somewhere along the way, he got really upset about the ranking there. Um, Dave Meltzer said there's a few other things that were involved with him being upset. He had chances to say things to me in public. Um, we were at the College for Alley Club. Scott Demore and I hosted a, a night for Canadians at the College for Alley Club. And Brett was there. Never said anything to me in person. Like, directly took me aside. Instead, he chose at the Iowa, you know, International Wrestling Hall of Fame to take myself and Steve Johnson the task for being journalists who don't know the wrestling business, and if you've never taken a bump, you should never be able to write about pro wrestling. Um, all those kind of things. And and the rant it has been documented. Uh, there's a transcript have actually on, on slamwrestling.net if somebody wants it. It's, uh, it's disappointing. And then from that point forward, Brett never wanted anything to do with the site. Um, and, and he was a columnist for us, right? He was a big part of slam wrestling becoming what it was. He had to deal with the Calgary Sun. Uh, we were able to run his columns. So, yeah, Brett was very important to my career, uh, to the sites, the growth of the site. Uh, and it's disappointing the way it happened. Um, but you forgive a little bit. He had a lot of strokes. He's had a lot of family issues. Um, and again, my problem was never with Brett. He had a problem with me. I, I think that's a fundamental part to remember. Do you think that answer, let, Brian? That's a, yeah, it answers my question. But one other thing, because you wrote that book a long time ago. Do you think if you wrote that book today... Brett would be ranked the same way today, or do you think the way people evaluate him and look at him today and the fact that so many of the top wrestlers cite him, does that change the way you see Brett today as opposed to really right after his career ended? 
Right. So part of our deal was if you were an active wrestler, we weren't going to put you in the top 25. Right. And so that, that continued on for all the other books. Right. So when you talked about the greatest heroes and icons, I mean, John Cena would be in there for sure, but he wasn't in our top 25 because he was still active. So that was the same with Brett. His career was only just ending as that book came out. And so he's not, I mean, he's in the top 25 and his career, I don't know. You're right. I think it maybe did grow in, in legacy afterwards because you had all these guys come afterwards who talked about what an influence he was, right? And how game-changing the Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart days were that really changed pro wrestling from being the bigger plotting guys to, well, it started the path to where we are today. They're not the only ones, of course, but that's part of it. So, yes, there's, there's obviously changes that are going to be done um, through the years, but then by the same token, you also learn more about other guys, right? Hans Schmidt probably deserved to be ranked higher than he was. Right. Just when you learn about his career and how he was so daring, really, for the time. Right. The kind of character he portrayed. I mean, that takes a lot more bravery to me than being on WWE TV and, uh, you know, knocking Americans. I don't know. It, it, it's, it's a subjective game. And nobody's ever said I'm the only one, only voice that matters. And I certainly never said that. Everyone's tried to their opinion. And I, uh, you know, I did my best with it. In in all fairness, the other ones were Steve and I. (laughs) But in all fairness, any top whatever list is subjective when you're dealing with art. Uh, It's not like who ran the five fastest miles. You can stopwatch that. It's it's painting or it's music, the five greatest rock and roll songs or whatever. So it's always subjective. But in all fairness, also. You wrote a book on tag teams. You did not name the Midnight Express the number one tag team. Did I threaten to beat you up or cuss you out? No, I did not. You said said something, uh, yeah, in in the copy of the book you signed, yes, you you did not believe it. I believe it was, uh, there were some nasty words in there, but that was okay. There were some nasty words, but I didn't threaten to beat you up. And and he had Bruiser Bedlam do it. Yeah. And besides, well, we didn't even a- make number two. Come to think of it, we, we didn't make number three. What what number were we? Uh, I don't have it in front of me. I can't remember. It was I, yeah. 11 or 12. Or so <laughs> yeah, that was. come to think of it, you son of a bitch. You, you ungrateful bastard. No, all right. All right. But see, I Can didn't I tell my upset. Bruiser Bedlam story, though? That was a good Go thing, Greg. Bruiser Bedlam threatened to kill me once. Yeah, yeah, no, he was a good buddy of mine. So, well... <laughs> So Johnny K-9 was a Hamilton guy, and a lot like tying it back into Ricky Johnson, he was an early guy in my career who let me in the door. I actually did programs for some of uh, Johnny K-9's shows that he ran in Hamilton. And so he was a friend of mine. And then years later, I'm doing slam wrestling and, and write a story about his career. And I include all the stuff about, you know, trying to blow up, uh, you know, police hey. stations and, and some drug stuff and when he saw me in the dressing room, he threatened to kill me. Why'd you have to write all that shit? All that kind of stuff. King Kong Bundy got up and stood in front of me. And then that calmed down uh, Bruiser Bedlam. So wow. that was that was a good moment. But then years later, the only interview he ever did was with me when he got out of the, the halfway house or whatever, and that he was um, doing acting and, and doing... Uh, protection work for actors and stuff like that. Like he was really trying to get out of the, you know, the, the lifestyle he was in. Okay. Last Bruce Bedlam story. I was at the funeral and uh, I've never been at a funeral where there were more fights before the thing started. <laughs> <laughs> that They were actually going to call the cops because they were, there was all family fighting this and that. And that was nuts. And then later I was told by, I think it was his wife, Tracy, that, they, she was told by a few people that guy must be a cop because I was the only person there wearing a suit. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of leather at that funeral. Oh, uh, Greg, you've always looked like a narc. Come on, admit it. You were, you were That's born okay. when you were born. You looked like you were a forty-year-old man. <laughs> I feel old, Jim. 
Anyway, so do we all. But thank you for being here today. Um, we got your plugs in. We encourage everybody to buy all of the products that we've talked about. And go to slamwrestling.net. And also uh, keep us up to date on the progress on the documentary. And, you know, if you have any follow-ups to this story, if anything else gets uncovered, we will, we will give the listeners updates. Greg, thank you very much. Thank you both, guys. Well, there we go, folks. A great interview with uh, Greg Oliver, and we will keep you up to date on any further happenings, discoveries, uncoverings, or whatever the term may be for this ongoing story. You think you've heard everything, Brian. Do you think you've heard everything? When it comes to Rocky Johnson? No. Oh, no. Well, no, no. when it comes to wrestling. No. There's always so much to, to learn.